Alrighty, so let's jump straight in to look at these last five games from yesterday midweek action. And we start off with a game that we almost saw this happen again from this week where it looked like a one-sided affair kind of a matchup. The team on the wrong end of that one-sided affair looked like they pulled off a shocking upset and able to win their first game in numerous meeting against their team that pretty much have dominated them in the past couple of meetings. And in this case, DC almost pulled off their first victory against the Union in seven games, but the Union in the end just able to get a, a draw out of this game thanks to an incredible goal that definitely is going to be in contention for goal of the week. Now, in the first half, I thought DC looked by far the better team early on as the Union. They just looked very sloppy in the midfield. I mean, there was just too many giveaway from the Union, and then it seemed like they were clearly losing the bat in the midfield although Sykes did did had to deny Montero in the 22nd minute and almost allow a ve very bad rebound for one of the Union players to basically score the opening goal but it was not meant meant to be at that point until in the 41st minute Andre Blake would make an, a big save to Rob Canals after there was a scramble in the box, but either way, we had to halftime, nil-nil between both of these teams, and in the second half, we finally got goals, and it happened in the 49th minute, when Anthony Fontana would score from Santos to give the Union a one nothing lead, but then after that, I thought there was definitely chances for both teams, and that there could have been a chance for the Union to double their lead, and that there could have been a chance for DC to potentially get the equalizer, and it turns out it was DC, the one that would get the equalizer as in the 70th minute. Pines would score from Assad a beautiful delivery from Yamil Assad from the corner where Pines ba basically was left left pr pretty un unmarked by the Union defense to be able to tie the game up. And then they kind of turned the game on hit its head a minute later when Bedoya was penalized for handball into the box which Assad was able to put away and all of a sudden DC has a 2-1 lead against the, the Union, and for all those teams that, of course, lost or drew this this weekend that is in the top four of the Eastern Conference, they must be very happy seeing this resort. Although, the Union would get the equalizer in the 87 minute, and as I mentioned before, they've just rescued themselves a point, thanks to Mark McKenzie score an absolute golazo for about 35 yards out. I mean, we have seen a lot of good golazo that has been scored this week and also in the last weekend so there's definitely going to be a very going to be very hard to decide which one exactly is going to be the goal of the week but this one is definitely going to be heavy contention with the way that he hit he absolutely smashed this one from such a long way out to get the union the tying goal and that would ends up to be the final score of this game as the shots in this one 14 compared to 12 the union has seven shots on goal compared to four the union has or four that DC had four shots that was off target compared to the one that the Union has six shots that was blocked compared to the four that the Union has and possession wise 58% possession compared to the 42% possession and again you know DC I feel like they have definitely played much better in these last two games compared to when Ben Olsen was still coaching this team but this is a game that they're gonna let be very frustrated because they could have got off three points in this game game against a very tough opponent opponent whereas the union you know i guess they'll be happy the fact that they're still able to just salvage a draw and do not lose some ground to teams that actually draw this weekend in the top four of the eastern conference but at the same time they're also going to be frustrated at the fact that this is supposed to be a very beatable team and especially a team that they have pretty much won the last seven matchup against them they'll be left a little bit frustrated the fact that they could not make it eight in a row and could not potentially gain some ground in turn terms of the team that is ahead of them that of course draw draw points during this week games now moving on into the next match it is dallas and sporting kc now dallas did win one nothing in this game but obviously the the big talking point of this game has to be that controversial call right near the end of the game that disallowed skc the equalizer and it was so controversial that peter vermees after the game he was he was going on rant mode in terms of the fact fact that he feels like that goal should have never been been disallowed and that there was also a couple of skc player even took 
get on Twitter to kind of criticize the the referee in terms of the fact that that goal should have never been disallowed. Now, before we get to that, in the first half, I thought the Mies pretty much go with a reserve team, and it looked like this was kind of a match that Peter Vermees was just saying, yeah, this is just going to be a throwaway game for Sporting KC. Like, I'm not even going to bother to start my strongest 11, I'm, and I'm just going to take my chances in the weekend's matchup instead instead of getting any points out of this one. And early on in this game, Dallas had a good opportunity to get the opening goal when Holland's had towering header that just went a little bit high. Before Pico in the 27th minute blazed a shot that was high from a tight angle. Then Holland's head sh shot had a good decent effort, but unfortunately hit straight to Tim Melia. But with the way that Dallas was kind of dominating, in the first half and that SKC was kind of defending and tried to hold on to this not just the first half but this entire game with a nil nil draw you knew that eventually Dallas was going to to get that goal and that they were really knocking on the door in this game and they finally got that goal in the 43rd minute when Holland's head was able to score from Ryan Reynolds to give Dallas a one nothing lead although I feel like Tim Melia probably could have done better in terms of this because while this was definitely a a powerful shot from Holland's head I feel like he probably c could have done better in in terms of covering his far post and he actually got a hands to that one but unfortunately I guess maybe it was just a little bit too pow powerful that he can't can't really pair that one away but since this is Tim Millian and he is considered one of the best goalkeeper in the league you would expect that one one is the one that he probably should have saved and that he will also probably look back at this and kind of want this one back in terms of a chance to not concede right on the stroke of half time now in the second half uh skc really started to bring on the cavalry as for me was really started to bring on some of his starters like Gotti kinda and johnny russell to hope that they can get a goal back in this game to salvage a draw but Dallas was continued to dominate this game. Barrios hit a shot that was just wide from 12 yards out before Franco Jara had a big chance from 6 yards out. But unfortunately, he couldn't put away. And in many ways, he missed a sitter at that point. Uh, before Melia had to deny Pico and that Dallas, they were definitely inching to get that second goal. However, as we get to the last 15 minute of the game, it looked like SKC were really started to pop the pressure. And Dallas was kind of started to just hold on on and feel like they can just just bunker in to, to salvage a one nothing win in this one and in the 81st minute Hatado almost did the same thing that he did in the last game where he scored a spectacular vault league goal to give the win winner in that game against Nashville well he almost did it again and almost at around the same time when he hits a volley for about 14 yards out this time it wasn't really from a tight angle but unfortunately this time he couldn't connect did well enough to basically put that one into the back of the net and then this is where the controversial call happened in the 86th minute and this is pretty much wh where the talking point of this game is so basically a lot of SKC players uh, and also Peter Mies and a lot of fans are very angry the fact that this this goal was disallowed because they feel like Jimmy Maurer basically fouled Gotti Kinnett in the the box there and kind of brought brought him down in the box instead of the other way around now i look at it a couple of times and originally i thought skc definitely have a shout the fact that 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 goal shouldn't have been disallowed and that indeed it looked like jimmy mauer brought down king in the box as that ball was kind of come in and originally mauer did not do a do a good job in terms of trying to hold on to the ball when martins was trying to cross it in and then it kind of, when he wasn't able to hold on and kind of creates a little bit of a sc scramble situation which kind of leads to that instant but the more i look at it i feel like the referee kind of got this one right and hear me out skc fans before you type some angry comments in the in the comment section below there's two reasons why i think this is probably the right call uh the first reason is that goalkeeper always get the benefit of the doubt whenever they try to scramble the ball like if you're a an attacker and you bump or make any contact to the goalkeeper the goalkeeper will always have the benefit of the doubt but the second big reason is that the more i look at it i kind of feel like 
like Jimmy Merrill was actually looking at the ball and as he was kind of looking at the ball and and it kind of looked more like Gadi Kinga was the one that kind of blocks him to try to get to the ball and hence kind of kind of brought him down into to the box there and that you know in the end if you are an attacker and you base basically kind of try to draw some contact with the goalkeeper then yeah that obviously is going go, going to be a foul in the box and again i know skc fans are not going to like it but at the end of the day i just feel like that is the two reason why i think it is the right call and ultimately you know after this game i kind of feel like skc they did they didn't really do much in this game that that kind of deserve at least a draw out of this i mean they had 15 shots in this game but they only had three of them that was on goal and they had seven shots off target put it to seven that dallas had and also dallas had 16 shots and seven shots on goal on um, the shots that was blocked five shots that was blocked compared to two that dallas had and possession wise 57 percent possession compared to 43 percent possession and that you know after this incident when there was a bunch of skc player was just swarming at the ref i was kind of surprised that that wasn't even a yellow card too like when you decide to swarm at the ref like that and kind of react very angry like that you, one of those players could have easily got a a yellow card in terms of that instant but the bottom line is like i said i don't think that throughout majority of the game probably besides the last 15 minutes where they were really going for it that they didn't look like they were in this game and that dallas for majority of this game were able, able to control it and that in the end they deserve all three points in this and finally ended that four game winless run that they had heading into this one but moving on in terms of the next match is RSL and the Portland Timbers now I said back in the preview that Giovanni Savarisi I was expecting he was going to kind of go with a reserve team in this game and in some way he did kind of go with a bit of a the B team against RSL although it was kind of a mixture of A slash B kind of team because there were a couple of players that play on the weekend against the San Jose Earthquakes that also started in this one and you can clearly see that those players were definitely tired coming in to this one now four minutes into this game speaking of controversy there was also some controversy in this game too where there was no penalty given to Portland after it looked like Putin basically brought down Paredes in the box and obviously Timbers fans are absolutely angry about that and I, I think this one they do have the a little bit of rights in terms of get angry because it definitely looked like Putin had basically bought down Paredes down into the box and that that would turns out to be cru a crucial moment in this game too because just seven minutes later RSL would get the opening goal in this game when douglas martinez was able to score the opening goal uh ivisic was actually in goal for this and despite the fact that he had an amazing performance in his first ever start in mls this one was less of that that i mean this was really kind of poor from ivisic first of all he was kind of a little bit indecided of whether or not if he sh should just come out to try to get the ball or the fact that he should j just stay in the net and that because of that the fact that he was kind of caught into two minds he basically punched the ball right into martinez that basically said yeah you know i might be str struggling things so far this season but if you decide to just tease the ball up to me right there then thank you very much i'm just gonna put this one into the back of the net and just like that rsl has a one nothing lead now it was it would be two nothing in favor of rsl when demar krylak was able to score from Ruiz. Uh, Ivisic did, did redeem himself a little bit in the 28th minute when he made a spectacular save denying DeMar Krylak like, his second goal and what would have been free nothing in favor of RSL and that you know doing that spell despite the fact that that we had that early controversial call in the first couple of minutes of this game RSL pretty much dominated the first half like they were really all over for the the timbers in this game and you can clearly see that they were were look to be more hung the more hunger team in this game and that they want to get themselves back into the playoff picture in the western conference now in the second half krylak almost made it three nothing away but unfortunately he wasn't able to do actually i don't know why 
I, I, I wrote after a lightning there, but but there there was kind kind of um, actually let me just erase this. This actually doesn't make any any sense whatsoever. And we'll just say that Krylak almost put away a chance to make it free nothing. And then two minutes later, it looked like it was free nothing in favor of RSL when Corey Bear was able to tuck it in. But unfortunately, the goal was disallowed because on the attacking sequence, there was an all offside that that was viewed, and therefore the game remains two nothing. Now, as the game continues, the Timbers started to kind of come back into this one with 20 minutes left, and that they were giving a life. Line in the 77th minute when Bill Tullinoma was able to score on the header after a beautiful delivery from Diego Valeri from the corner. And then it all looked like they tied the game up at two apiece in, in the 78th minute when Putna basically they looked like he committed a goalkeeping howder when he completely misjudged the ball that was coming into the box. And after there was a bit of a scramble that was going on in the box, Portland aren't able to find a way to slot that one in. And that in the latter part of this game, again, Portland was just really pushing to trying to get the equalizer. And I'm pretty sure a lot of RSL fans and, and the 4,000 soul that was in that stadium at Rio Tinto was really on their edge of the seat, seats, knowing the fact that their team was just, just holding on for dear life to get the crucial free points. But in the end, they did get the crucial three points in this one as the shots in this game 13 shots compared to 10 that portland has four shots on goal that both team has five shots off turret compared to three that portland has four shots that was blocked compared to three that the timbers had and possession wise 48 percent possession compared to 52 percent possession that the portland timbers had and really for rsl this was a map a win that they desperately needed consider how things have gone and for portland you know i'm just gonna say the same thing with the timbers as what i say with skc Yes, they did have a controversial call that gone against them. But overall, I think if you look at the balance of the entire game, I feel like RSL kind of uh, deserved this one and that they were just able to put away way enough chances in this game to able to get the, the massive three points that they really needed, needed coming into this one. Speaking of a team that desperately needed some three points, well, Vancouver also got three points in this game and also put some pressure in terms of a couple of teams as above the red line right now as they were able to win 2-1 against LAFC and I think I did say in the preview that I did kind of make a bold prediction by predicting Vancouver winning this one over LAFC well after watching this game I don't really feel like it was really a bold prediction but more like it looked like it was bound bound to happen for LAFC that this was a loss coming into the hand knowing the fact that since they are so depleted in terms of their squad they were basically forced to play the same team that they played against the Seattle Sounders and after such an emotional and drain, draining kind of a win against the Sounders on the road to just quickly recover in three days to play against a lesser team that is the Vancouver Whitecaps yeah that is good that is very hard to try to adjust yourself and try trying to kind of kind of use the same amount of of energy that they shown in that Seattle ga game compared to this one against the Vancouver Whitecaps and early on in the first half Montero could have made it one nothing in favor of Vancouver but unfortunately he wasn't able to slot sit home from about four yards out uh, the Whitecaps were definitely by far the better team early in this game and that they had a scramble in the box in the 26th minute where Cavallini basically was able to strike get strike it it after there was a after that that scramble in the box but fortunately Sesiaga was able to deny him and actually made an incredible save to deny Cavallini after he was able to hit it with so much power from close range but Fortunately for Cavallini, he would get on the score sheet, and it happened in the 30th minute when he scored from Dahomey and Montero to give the Whitecaps a 1-0 lead, and that would, turns out to be the score at halftime. Before in the second half, he would score again, this time once again from Montero and Dahomey to give the Whitecaps a 2-0 lead, but LAFC were started to kind of come back into this one, and they were giving a lifeline in the 81st minute when the VAR basically ruled that there was a ha handball in the box and it was Jake Novinsky, the culprit in terms of this handball. Now, originally, Bush was able to deny 
deny Atuesta in the box and or deny Atuesta from the penalty spot. And I thought that was not really a a good penalty from Atuesta, but still a re very decent save from Evan Bush. Only problem is he went off his lines a little bit too quick. And throughout this season, I know there's been some controversial call in terms of goalkeeper going off his lines way too early. But this one was as blatant as possible. I mean, Evan Bush probably took like two or three steps off his lines when he saved that one. And under this new rule, you just cannot do that if you're a goalkeeper trying to save a penalty. So, they of course did retake this. But this time, Atuesta make no mistake and able to give a light line for LAFC. As the LAFC was really going all out on the attack in Vancouver. As we see many times before this season when they're trying to hold on to the lead late in the game. They were pretty much going all hands on deck and hope to get a massive three points. Which also like what we've seen throughout the season. They're able to do that at the end. As they get a big victory in this one against LAFC. Shots in this one. Both team had 13 shots. Four shots on Gokupi, the one that LAFC had. Eight shots off target compared to the six that LAFC had. One shot that was blocked compared to the six that LAFC had. And possession-wise, 59% possession compared to the 41% possession. Uh, for LAFC, you know, they're just going to have to move on from this resort. And that they're just going to have to ride the storm in term, terms of the fact that, you know, in, in the next, next week or two or so, I think this LAFC team is going to to get some, some of their main player that is either on international duty or or went out with an injury back into this team. Whereas for the Vancouver Whitecaps, you know, even though they were playing a deplete, depleted LAFC team, you know, they of course got the job done, get this massive three points. And don't look now, the Vancouver Whitecaps is actually above the red line. Remember a couple of weeks ago, it looked like they were dead and buried with a couple of lopsided losses. Yeah, welcome to 2020 MLS season, where just if you go on a bad, bad run, but you get a couple of wins in a row, you can easily get yourself back into the playoff picture. And you should also ask the San Jose Earthquakes in terms of that, because moving on into the very next match. So I knew coming into this game for the for the Quakes, this was definitely a must win for the Quakes. And it's not very often I say must win for the quakes when they are on the road but knowing how other resort has already hap happened from this midweek action this was a game that the quakes got to to win so that they can create a little bit of a gap in terms of their 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 chances of making the playoffs and staying above the red line well not only the fact that they got the job done in this game but this was probably the most dominant road performance I've seen from the San Jose Earthquakes probably since 2015 when they won 5 nothing against Sporting KC on the road. Now, in the first half, uh, Jonathan Kinsman actually gets the start over D David Bingham. And I thought Kinsman were by far the best player for the Galaxy. And if it, if it wasn't for him making a couple of decent saves, this could have been even more uglier than what the 4 nothing scoreline was would indicate and that you know I kind of do feel bad for Kinsman knowing the fact that this is his first ever MLS starts and he basically just got completely hung out to dry by this Galaxy defense that was basically once again non-existent in this one now he did make a big save to deny Tommy Thompson from close range in the 11th minute uh the Quakes they were all over the Galaxy there was one point of this game where possession wise was like 77 Compared to just 23% possession that the Galaxy had. And the Galaxy barely even crossed the Quakes half for pretty much for the first 24 minutes. But the problem is, the Quakes, there's just no finishing product. And as much as I'm, I'm enjoying the fact that the Quakes are in complete control in this game, I'm also very frustrated the fact that there's just no finishing product whatsoever. And the final third, once again, look very poor from this team. Now, the Galaxy did start to kind of come back into this game right around the 30th minute mark. And this is where I get a little bit nervous. The fact that because we dominate for so long in this game, what if the Galaxy are going to just score a goal and it would be a sucker punch goal that the Quakes, of course, suffer. I mean, in the last game against Portland, that was a classic example where I fought the Quakes play decently in the first half against the Timbers. But then in the second half, the lapse of concentration shouldn't happen in the second half and that got sucker punch punch in that mo moment and go down one nothing and they just never recover 
from it until that point. Now, fortunately, it did not happen in this game. And instead, the Quakes did get a deserved 1-0 lead. And it would be Nick Lima that was able to score from Andy Rios. And as much as I have been a huge critic of Andy Rios, and you know how, how if you follow me on Twitter, I call him the lamppost for a reason. Uh, he has actually have been having some decent game in the last couple of ones by not only scoring goals, but also getting some assists in this. So it turns out he isn't as useless as what I thought he he was in in the beginning of the season and that he seems to be in a very good form in the last couple of games. And his good form will show again in this one, not only getting on the assist chart, but also getting on the goal scoring chart when he was able to score in the 52nd minute from Carlos Fierro to make it 2 nothing in favor of the San Jose Earthquakes. This was also kind of a fuck you kind of moment meant to me because these are also two guys that that I criticize with this quake team but yet they somehow were able to combine to eat each other and pretty much made me eat a bunch of shit because of the fact that of uh, the fact that they were able to make a good combination and actually prove me wrong for once now in the 65th minute uh kinsman was able to de deny a chance for the quakes i believe he was able to deny wando in this chance but he almost allowed a juicy c re bound for one of the Quakes player to slots at home before he would rob Wando again this time the shot was actually deflected but he was able to make a quick adjustment to bait so they saved this one despite the fact the sh shot from Wando was deflected but ultimately it would be free nothing in favor of the Quakes and this goal pretty much was game set and match when Tommy Thompson was able to make it free nothing and this was also kind of a very FIFA-esque goal goal where you know how how when you play fifa and you basically shoot to the goalkeeper on the break go away and they save it you always try to to press the the shoot button as quick as possible because you're trying to hit it on the on the rebound into the empty net well that is exactly what happened in this instant where despite the fact that kinsman did a good job in terms of robbing tommy thompson originally to tommy thompson was able to get to just such a tight angle where not a lot of player is able to score from such a tight angle especially on a volley like that but he hits it absolutely perfect into the empty net to make it free nothing and pretty much was was the game at that point but at the same time i was also hoping the fact that you know the quakes yes they're gonna walk out with all three points out of this game but can they keep a clean sheet in this one and i feel like a clean sheet would really do a lot of Compton to JT Markskowski considered the last game he definitely did not have his best moment well he would get even more confident now because in the 87 minute he prevented the Galaxy scoring a goal and kept his clean sheet when he was able to rob Ethan Zubak from close range before it would be 4 nothing in favor of the San Jose Earthquakes when Nick Lima would have his first multi-goal game in his career from K Cow and what a hit this was from Lima. I mean, I know so far this season we have had, had or from this week we had had so many good goals, which is why I, I didn't put goal of the week with a question mark because, because you know, there's already been so many goal of the week contention. I think this one will will be, will be one that might might not be in contention with the way that other ones were just as good as what this goal is. But at the same time, I also thought that this was a great goal with the way that he just absolutely smashed this one for about 24 yards out and pretty much put the cherry on the top for the quakes in a in a complete performance in this one against the galaxy shots in this game 19 shots compared to eight that the galaxy had 10 shots on goal compared to three that the galaxy had six shots off target compared to four that the galaxy had three shots out was blocked compared to one that the galaxy had and possession wise 62 percent possession compared to 38 percent possession and i know after this game you're probably asking me well am i now sold the fact that the quakes were able to put on an impressive performance against a rival like the galaxy the answer is no i am still not so yet and yes this was a great performance but here's the thing this was more to do with the fact that the galaxy who now have lost six in a row and that you know how i said back in that video where I talked about the most likely head coach that's going to be fired this season and why I put Skeleto right on the top of the list. 
this is a game that just shows why he might be the next one to go. Because you can clearly see the Galaxy player, they're not even playing for him anymore. Like, there's just no effort whatsoever in this game. And consider this is supposed to be a, a Derby and the Cali Classical. You would think that they would be actually be up for this game, especially they're playing at home in this one. But nope, instead they just show no energy whatsoever. They look like they were down and out for majority of the game. And also the tactics in this game for the Galaxy was all wrong once again. Like, why in the world are they repeatedly week in and week out play a high, high line when they clearly don't have the players to, to do that and because of the fact that they tried to play a high line like that they just completely exposed themselves at the back and we saw multiple time in this game the quakes pretty much just uncontested whenever they go on the attack and that if the quakes were maybe a little bit better in terms of their finishing or the fact that they they could have been been even a little bit better in terms of the final third again this would have been more than just a four nothing resort that the galaxy suffer in this one so yeah you know i understand that galaxy fans are frustrated with this team and they demand skeleto out and i have to agree with them and in some way i kind of feel bad for them too because this is just ridiculous with the way way how how in a team that has such a good talent like this this team has and have such a good such an expectation of making the playoffs now looking like the laughing stock of the league just because all the fact that it doesn't seem like the players don't even care about playing for this team anymore. But yeah, that being said, that is pretty much it for the review of all the games from this midweek action. Tomorrow, I, of course, will once again go back in terms of doing the, the preview for the weekend game. And hopefully this time there's going to be no game that is going to be postponed this weekend. Well, that being said, I, you know, since I just said that, probably we're going to have one or two games that is going to be postponed in the weekend matchup but hopefully that is not going to be the case and that hope that you guys will stay tuned in terms of me once again previewing what will be another full slate of mls action where there's going to be 12 games that's happening this weekend but until then hope you guys enjoyed this video let me know in the comments below what do you think of these five games and yeah hope you guys enjoyed this video and i will see you guys next time